All right. Good afternoon. It is 2.15, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the 2023 TWC Workforce Forum. It's about to end, but still. Um, you are currently in the employee training and placing Texans in high paying jobs session. My name is Hope Hemingway. I'm gonna be your moderator. I'm just gonna be monitoring the room, handling any issues that arise. I'll also be the person running around with this microphone, handing it to you if you have any questions. Um, just so you guys know, all forum materials will be available on the TWC website. Before we get started, please make sure to silence all of your electronic devices, and if you have any calls, anything urgent, uh, we ask that you please take that out into the hallway. If time permits, at the conclusion of the presentation, there'll be a Q&A period. Um, please raise your hand so I can bring the microphone to you. We are recording the session, and it's an audio recording, so we wanna make sure that all questions can be clearly understood. If we don't have enough time to answer your questions, uh, you may request the presenter's contact info at the end of the session. You will also receive an electronic survey after the event, so make sure that you complete that as your feedback is greatly appreciated. And last but not least, um, this session is approved for CRC slash CEU credit, so make sure that you head over to their table in the pre-function area so you can get that credit. With that, uh, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I'm going to go ahead and welcome our panelists. You guys now have the floor. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Congratulations. You made it to the end, right? We're the last session, so it's always the best part to be. <laughs> they saved the left best for last. But the hardest part is making sure we keep everybody engaged and uh, awake, right? So we're all probably thinking of trying to make our ways home. Well, good afternoon once again. My name is Cledia Hernandez, and I serve the wonderful state of Texas as the Vice Chancellor for External Relations at Texas State Technical College. Joining me today is also my colleague, Kyle Smith, that helps us as Associate Vice Chancellor for Special Projects. And we're very excited to be here today to be able to share with you a little bit of what makes TSTC different and how we have uh, completely been innovative in how we approach building a strong workforce for the state of Texas. If you're not familiar with TSTC, we are actually a state agency. We are one state college, a technical college. We're not a community college. We're not a university. We are a technical college that serves the entire state of Texas. We've been established in 10 different locations by the legislature. And we have 10 campuses around the state, and we are launching our 11th location come this fall in the New Braunfels area. One of the things that makes TSTC different is the legislature established us with a very specific focus. So today we want to really focus on three primary things. Why we do what we do, what we do, and how we go about doing that very differently and innovatively. TSTC prides itself in not being a traditional higher ed institution. Part of our why, and you'll see here in our mission, in our, uh, the code that establishes us, it talks about what we are focused and established to do. We have been established to improve the competitiveness of the state of Texas through, for business and industry. The way that we approach and what we do is we actually reverse engineer the needs of business and industry. So who is the primary focus for TSTC? It's the employer. Making sure that we're able to meet their needs, that we're able to build a, a training program that's going to address the skills that they're looking for to be able to prepare individuals to go to work for them. How can they be competitive in the, within their industry and be able to continue to move the needle on their regard. And so we try to make sure that our primary client, our primary customer is the employer and that we're able to give them that competitive advantage. Throughout our code, we you will see that we are also an economic development engine for the state of Texas through workforce development. So we work very closely with the local workforce boards as they identify target occupations, high demand industries, because we also keep a pulse on what the needs and the growing demands for industry are within our region. 
As I shared previously, we are in 10 different locations, and so we work with every single workforce board within those regions. We sit with them at the table as a tool, I like to call as a tool in their tool belt of how they're able to provide services to their clients. As they're trying to make sure that they're able to get people in jobs, guess what? That is our purpose and our goal as well. Our mantra is that we play, our purpose is to place more Texans in great paying jobs. But it's not just about placing them in a job, it's leading them into a career. So when we talk about retention and concerns of be, them showing up after the first, second, third, fourth quarter in, uh, in, pl in placement and employment, we do that as well. That is exactly what we focus on, making sure that we're able to provide skills training, let it be for reskilling, upskilling, but more importantly, how can we get them into the job? So who is the one that is driving what we do? Industry. Because if we can't get them a job, then we have not met our mission. Employer success is one of our primary focuses. And then it's student success. For employers, we want to make sure that we develop a skilled workforce that gives that employer a competitive advantage within their industry and to be able to give them that c complete match between employee and employer that will help with retention and turnover. Our commitment to our students is making sure that we are able to provide them the skills needed for them to be hireable and to be able to be more marketable within their industry and their discipline. And we provide that through it, we provide wraparound services through our career services department to make sure that we're able to provide them from soft skills training all the way to be able to interview and be able to go and get that job. As I mentioned, why we do what we do, what we do, and how we do it. The how is so important because we have been challenged by our leadership to make sure that we're being innovative and holding ourselves accountable. So I like to say that we are held accountable by the state of Texas through our accountability formula. The way that TSTC gets funded is very different from any other higher ed institution. Majority of the community colleges and universities, they get funded by the state of Texas based on how many hours are able to keep a student in the classroom. Makes sense, right? You have them in the classroom for 100 hours times an hourly wage or, or rate, I should say, and that is how this, the community college or the university gets funded by the state of Texas. TSTC, again, is different in that regard. We, when we were talking with the legislature, when they were talking about accountability and holding the institutions accountable, we said about 10 years ago, sign us up. So we have completely revamped how we get funded by the state of Texas. And it truly is an outcomes-based formula. What we do is we actually have a collaboration and a, and a contract agreement, data sharing agreement with the Workforce Commission to be able to track our students for five years after they leave TSTC. So remember I said it's not about just getting them into the job, it's about getting them into a career. And so the way that we get funded is we track these students for five years, so it's really a results-based funding formula. Graduate employment matters as well as, and not seat time, as well as the progression and growth professionally for our students. So they track them for five years, based on their wages compared to what a minimum wage would be making, and we get a commission off of that. So let me give you an example. If Gladia goes through a TSTC program and goes out and gets a minimum wage job, the state will fund TSTC zero dollars for Gladia because TSTC did not impact that student. We did not but we were not able to contribute to that individual's opportunity to be able to impact the economy of the state of Texas. If Gledia goes out and gets no job, TSTC gets zero funding. But if TSTC does their work and they do it well, and we have, and we do, when Gledia goes out and gets that job as an entry level, went through the lineman program, a one to two year program, she exits into the market and starts making $70,000 a year. I'm not making up that number. After two years of training within our lineman program, 
our graduates are starting at $70,000 a year. And then Claudia works really hard because she's amazing. And she goes on to get a promotion over the next two, three, four, five years. TSTC will get a commission off of that wage increase. So it genuinely is an accountability model. So we don't only say that we're account made accountable by our, our great state. Our employers also hold us accountable and our students hold us accountable because they're paying for an education to be able to get them into a career. So we have actually launched a money back guarantee program. Who loves money back guarantees, right? They're gonna prove to you that the, what they're selling you or what they're providing you works. Well, TSTC has been able to pilot this program amongst several of our programs. And if our students opt into this program and participate in all of the, all of the training opportunities, not only in our technical training, but our soft skills training, our preparation for a job interviewing and being able to resume writing, all of the other things that come in with being able to find a job, if, if they go through that entire program, and if we are not able to help them get into a job after six months of them finishing our program, we will, we will refund their money. So they get a degree, they get a job, or they get a refund. Till this day, we have not had to. They've, there's been, you know, we, my chancellor often says, I want that one because I want people to know that we will refund them the money. But so far, we've been very successful where we have not had to return any of those funds. And it really goes back to how we, re we prepare our students to go out into the workforce. It's listening to the employer partners. It's working with our partners in the community, like our local workforce boards, that are being able to track the in-demand, high-paying jobs in our regions. And then our amazing subject matter experts take that information of what are those skill sets that they're needing to be able to get those positions filled, and then we reverse engineer that training program. So now I'm gonna invite my partner Kyle, to be able to share a little bit about our performance-based education. Thank you, Claudia. What is performance-based education? Those of you that are familiar with competency-based education and those programs that are taking fire across the nation, this is a version of competency-based education. We chose a moniker of performance-based to match this performance-based system of funding. So it's more of an internal cultural buy-in for our, our employees and our faculty. So PBE is nationally known as CBE. But we've got some differences with ours. Uh, to, and, and it's because many of the competency-based programs you come across in America are for academic courses. How do you do a competency-based program for a technical program with a hands-on face-to-face lab component. So we've really, really had to spend several years working on this model, but we've launched. We launched six programs two years ago, and we launched 13 this fall, and we've got to run through our entire inventory in the next three to four years. So this is our direction. What it, what it boils down to is, Clydia was talking about the uh, performance-based system of funding, the results-driven, the accountability model, it just didn't make any sense to our chancellor and our leadership to move to that type of a novel system of accountability and continue to teach the same way we had always taught, more of a, a time-based contact hour system. So we were charged with coming up with an instructional delivery model that aligns with this new system of funding from the state of Texas. So we chose competency-based and we've developed our own version of that. And so, that's really what this first slide speaks to. It is a version of CBE. It is course-based. Now there is a version of competency-based that is pure 100% competency-driven known as direct assessment. That may be something that we step into in the near future, but right now we've remained course-based with it. It is again performance-based, and again, we wanted to get alignment with our funding formula. So Clydia had spoken initially about the what and the why and the how, and the PBE uh, move for us is a little bit of all three rolled and wrapped into one. So let's get into the, the nuts and bolts, which is where I like to live. 
This is uh, mastery based. I can tell you right now what may, you may find shocking is the grading for this is ABF, no C's and D's. You're either AB mastery or you are not. And what, what drives this, and I'll use myself as an example, math was always my weak area. And I remember getting into high school and taking Algebra 1 and then Geometry and Algebra 2, and when I received a 70 by virtue of extra credit and anything else I could scratch out, it was as good as gold to me. If I could eke out that 70 and get by, great. But what's the reality of that? You're being given credit for a course in which you may not have mastered up to one third of the content. And cumulatively over time, that catches up with you. You keep making that 70, missing 30%. Seven, and that's why college algebra for me was, the, was a proverbial gatekeeper course. I was happy at the time getting those 70s, but I realized I was cheating myself when I got into that college algebra class in Odessa, at Odessa College before there was developmental education or anything else, and I got in there and I got hit right between the eyes. And I made a C. One of the few C's on any of my transcripts was right then and there. And so in competency-based in that approach, you you have to show proficiency in each competency before you move on to the next. If there are 10 modules in a course, you're not graded based on completing eight out of 10 modules. You're graded on getting at least 80% in each of the 10 modules. That's a whole new way. That's, that's trying to put out a higher quality graduate in this placement model. Because if we just worry about getting them across the stage and it ends there, we're gonna burn bridges with those employers in this, in this system. So we have to put out the best product we can. Well, what about the students that have come to us since we've implemented and say, well, Mr. Smith, and I taught for 18 years, so I used to hear it all. But uh, Mr. Smith, what about the fact I live by the sea? And remember, Mr. Smith, these get degrees. Well, I would ask that student, would you rather have, like I did in many college courses, three exams, a final, and that the average is the average? Each exam was a one and done. No retakes, no extra credit. You were either a good test taker, which is a whole other thing we could spend time on, or you're not. You're either a good note taker, or you are not. You'll sink or swim, based on your ability to take a test and to take notes. But it, you know, and so if you weren't allowed to drop a grade, in which some of the professors did not allow that, there was a lot of pressure on each exam. And it was easy to make a B or a C and feel like that really you were better than that. So I would tell that student, would you rather have one shot at an exam and take that average, or would you rather have multiple attempts at a competency? And by the way, the multiple attempts will tend to move that information from short-term to long-term memory, which is what we want you to have when you're carrying it over into a career. And so when you explain it right, if you do the advising piece right, this ABF grading system is not so daunting for students. It actually is a help, a help to them. After a student may, may have failed uh, on their second or third attempt of that, of that competency, there's an intervention. We have PBE mentors, we have the faculty members. What is it that is tripping that student up? Let's get with them and try to alleviate it. At the end of the day, we can get them passed with an 80%. We might raise that coincidentally to 90% in the future, but 80% has been our starting point. Um, they're better off for it. So again, the advising piece is huge and the mentorship piece is huge in supporting the students. And I know in the 18 years I taught, I would have loved to have taught in this system because for me, I always had those students that were more advanced and really I was trying to keep them from being bored. I had those that needed more of me and there weren't enough office hours in the year to, to meet the needs of those students. And so you kind of talk to the middle and hope for the best. In this model, it may be course-based, but it's non-cohort. If the horses can run, you let them run. That'll leave you more time to work with the ones that need you the most. And so the way to summarize this best is it is, I've spoken to the 
multiple attempts, the personalized learning. The way to summarize it best, if I was explaining it to faculty here and now, is that in the, the system I taught in and we've typically all taught in uh, for years, is that time is the constant and learning is the variable. That's been used a lot. I, I've, I've stolen that because I think it's a really apt description of this. When I first taught, in the fall of 1994, my department chair handed me a syllabus and said, there's 16 weeks in the semester, your book has 16 chapters in it, go figure. It was a race against time and God forbid you had a bad weather day or anything like that. It was not about whether they learned it or not, it was about getting that material done on that timeline. How did we know that we were ready for the next semester? Because there was a date that said the previous one ended. And here's the date when the next one starts. In this model, learning becomes the constant and time becomes the variable. We flip it upside down. So however long it takes that student to complete is going to maybe be, be different. We've had many situations, even once we adopted this placement model, where we had students that were ready to go. I remember in Brownwood at our welding program, uh, department chair came to me about February or March, very close to where we're at now in the spring semester, said, I've got a student, she's the top, by the way, the females are the best welders, we know that, that she's the top in the class, I've taught her everything I can possibly teach her, because of her personal situation, she's got a job offer, she's gonna have to take it. <coughs> she leaves now, and I have all these absences on the roll sheet for the rest of the semester, do I have to give her an F? I said, you know what? Wink, wink, sort her out, let her go. We'll give her, the, give her the A, I'll take the consequences on that. Really before we'd even move to this model. But the point was, if they're ready to go, let them go. For us in this placement model, the sooner they start knocking down a paycheck, the sooner they're in the model. So there's a, there's a lot of rhyme and reason speaking to what Clidia was saying about the why and the what. Why are we doing what we're doing and what are we doing you know, and there's a lot of detail, more detail than you'd probably ever want to see. On the support side, ooh, we visited colleges that have been running competency-based programs, and they told us very quickly, it takes about 18 months to properly deconstruct a curriculum, move it from traditional to a competency-based model, and they said, you better be very deliberate about that deconstruction process. You need to hire instructional designers. You need subject matter experts in curriculum. They can break it down into competencies and then reconstruct the course in a competency-based format, and it does. It takes about 18 months. The heavy lift in all of this is the curriculum piece. It takes a while, and you've got a lot of hardcore, good-hearted individuals that culturally are gonna be resistant. It's that old Peter Drucker quote from those management books in the 70s, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And I would say it'll eat, it'll eat it for breakfast, lunch, and supper when you hit faculty with a program like this. So you better, you better know what you're talking about and you better have done your homework. Culture is huge, huge in this. I would say for the most part, the challenges that we've had have not been technical, they've been more cultural in nature. Just getting even some of our best people to think about things in a different way. They've been so good for so long at how they've done it, what's their incentive to change? So you really have to work that piece. And I mentioned the, the mentors are really the program enrollment coaches. Uh, we've built that piece in. Here's, uh, here's where the rubber meets the road. These are the three drivers behind the PBE program. There's acceleration, uh, accessibility, acceleration in the competency-based transcript, and we take those one at a time in this slide presentation. The accessibility, flexible scheduling. We, some of you may, if you work in higher ed, you may have heard the acronym MIMI, multiple entry, multiple exit. Here's what we've not seen in traditional, and this has been everywhere I've worked in higher ed. Inevitably, you'll have students wanting into a program after the census date. And you, you have to tell them, you're gonna have to wait till the next intake. You're gonna have to wait till the next entry. Some programs only have taken students in once a year, maybe twice a year. You tell somebody they gotta wait six or nine months, guess what? They're gone. 
They're not waiting around. If you do the curriculum correct in PBE, in a face, even using a face-to-face -face lab as an example, you can take new students in at entry points throughout that semester. You can mix uh, different levels of learners on the lab floor at the same time. This blows people's minds until you see it in action. It's wonderful. In fact, those advanced students become unofficial mentors to those younger students, and those younger students will say, I learned more from those fellow students than I ever did in the faculty. Not every time, but there's advantages to it. So Mimi is multiple entry, multiple exit. We tend to fo focus on the multiple entry. In the, in the past year or two, we've been having an extra entry point at the six week mark of the semester, allowing new students in. And we're getting some takers and we're able to assimilate, accommodate those students as they come in. So the number of entry points for a prospective student to enter their given program of study is going up significantly for every program that goes PBE. It's more of a challenge in a hybrid program with face-to-face -face labs as it has been obviously with purely 100% online programs. So some of the challenges are just different when you have the face-to-face -face component, but we're doing it for both, both modalities. What's interesting is the multiple exit side of this. It doesn't really get that much attention, but after you've been implementing Mimi a couple of years, you're gonna start exiting people, exiting students, exiting graduates into the marketplace more often. I was in a meeting here, in, here at our campus, near here, Hutto, and was listening to uh, heating and air conditioning representatives from business and industry that told us, you know, you're doing a great and wonderful job, but you're only putting graduates out once a year. You have that one graduation, by the time we get there, the cream of the crop's gone, or they're all gone. In this model, you're gonna be exiting people throughout the year, which is gonna meet, be able to spread it out a little bit more and meet some of those uh, targeted needs. So that's, uh, that's the beauty of the multiple exit side of it. And again, you're letting them work at their own rate. So when they're ready to go, you let them go. You don't have to hold them any longer than you have to hold them. I've been in areas, Midland, Odessa, went to college out there. Oil was high at times. Here came the employers looking to get people off the campus and bring them into work. And people say, God, we need to bar those employers from the campus, they're so disruptive. How dare they come and want to offer these kids a job before they've finished? Placement would be a bad thing. We've got to keep them. We've got to, you know, we've got to have our completion rates. And so, and I lived in that world for almost 20 years, so I understand it. This is a the great thing about TSTC is uh, in this, this new funding formula and this new approach is we are really, really able to meet the student on an individual basis, meet them where they're at when they come in, and then be able to uh, get them out in the workforce when they're ready. No, no more, no less. And so we, I really, really wished I could go back and teach in this model, honestly. The acceleration piece, this is very, this is very novel, very interesting. It's not exclusive. I will give a shout out to colleagues at Texas A&M Commerce. They're running baccalaureate programs in a model similar to this, uh, fully online programs. They're not doing the technical programs with the face-to-face -face lab components. But um, you come in, you register for two courses, you pay $750, you have seven weeks. Anything you finish beyond those two seven weeks, you get for free. It's called a subscription rate. More or less, we refer to it as an all-you-can-eat buffet. We've adopted that. We sign you up for a certain number of courses. If you're a full-time student, sign you up for your normal regimen of courses at the beginning of the semester. If you finish those courses early and you can bite the next one off in the sequence and there's enough time, reasonable time left in the semester to do it, you get to go ahead and take that course in this semester for free. That's a way to accelerate. There is a way to cut time to completion this, this, we have students that are go-getters right now that are absolutely taking this to the bank. They're gonna cut a semester to a semester and a half off their time of completion. And we don't offer higher level degrees than associate degrees. They're gonna cut that much time and they're gonna save cost because some of the content they're now going to get for free. You might remember, wasn't that many 
a little over a decade ago, the governor, Governor Perry at that time charged us with trying to get baccalaureate degrees under $10,000 or less. People said mission impossible. One of the results, one of the outcomes of that was to compress baccalaureate degrees down to 120 hours. Our associate degrees went from 72 to 60. And it seemed like the approach was just to remove content. We feel pretty good that we're not removing content in this, but we are making it potentially cheaper and we are allowing students to cut time to completion while <coughs> by virtue of a competency-based mastery level grading system trying to up the quality at the same time. So uh, prior learning, a P we call that a PLA. Once you've broken a, a curriculum into competencies, you have everything you need to develop a prior learning assessment. We're exercising, exercising that right now with a few individuals. We think it's gonna be perfect for those veterans, those folks exiting the military that have worked in some of these areas and we can go ahead and give them prior we can give them credit for prior learning in this competency-based model. And that's kind of an accelerant in and of itself to be able to do that. So once you've done that heavy lift on the curriculum, you have everything you need to do badges, micro-credentials, prior learning assessment, all of that is fair game and we have some examples of that. The competency-based transcript is, um, Something that not, not everybody that runs a competency-based program does, but um, it's one of the add-ons that we wanted in our program. We know this. When we go out in, tra in traditional, and I, I attended many an advisory board meeting and things, we use a lot of higher ed ling lingo. We're really good at using acronyms. And for those that are in business and industry, they don't, I don't think they always realize exactly what we're speaking to. We can give a, a transcript to a potential employer that lists courses and prefixes and such. Does it really tell them what a student has mastered, what they've learned? So the competency-based tr transcript is an attempt to bridge that language gap between higher ed and business and industry by listing out the competencies that that student has actually mastered in that program, that certificate, that associate degree, and we've had a really good response on this. It's like finally we are, we, we can see clearly what they've what they've been able to accomplish. Um, there's a, there's just a lot with the nuts and bolts that we could we could speak to on this. We tend to hand this uh, this out as a flyer to prospective students and parents. It's talking about traditional versus this performance based, what's exclusive, what overlaps. And um, so we just think it's a good place, a good place to start. Now, any questions on that before I move into the companion, the sister initiative that we have? Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a real challenge um, to get the right information in front of individuals because people, you know, that when you first talk about this, this is a lot to digest. This is a lot to take in. It's hard to do it justice in just a, a few minutes, but we're just trying to be as transparent with potential students and parents as possible. The advising piece on this is huge. I'll give you a couple of examples. The first time we implemented in those six programs in the fall of 21, we had students that, those that were serious students, they took off. This was like a fish to water. They took off. The, in, this, in this program, students take more accountability for their learning. So those that were go-getters, serious, they, they've done phenomenally well. They're accessing the free content. If you come in there and you're, you're not as dedicated, you're not coming in there w with maybe time management skills and things like that, it caught some students off guard to begin with. You know, we had students that said, hey, I was, they were running a 93 average through module eight, as an example. Well, there's 10 modules. Well, I've got a 93 average. It's kind of like, what can I, how low can I make on the final and still pass the course? And so they took their foot off the gas. They got an F. 
why did I get an F? I was running a 93. We told you it's an 80% in each module, not 80% 8 out of 10 modules. So we had some advising challenges. Even though we had said it, we didn't say it enough, didn't emphasize it enough. Uh, we had students in our model where they, we've allowed them to choose the times that they want to come to the face-to-face -face labs. And we'll put our faculty, um, you know, we'll group our faculty scheduling around those times. Well, we had some that had chosen times, and then guess what? They didn't show up. And so there is a huge, huge tie-in to soft skills in this model. You're taking more accountability for your learning. Time management is huge in this. The ability to self-direct is huge in this. It's not self-paced. It's what we call self-guided. It's a journey the faculty and the student takes together. They take more accountability in this. Our quality enhancement plan with our accreditor is on the soft skills. And since COVID, that's even become more acute in some, with some of these kids. So there's a lot there, but you absolutely address soft skills in this model. We've actually had to build in some assessment along those lines for those kids that are, that are not taking it as serious as they need to. We're telling them, we're preparing you for a job. We're gonna consider this uh, like a job for you and attendance and punctuality all part of the equation. Yes. How much of your student base is non-traditional students? Um, individuals who are older who have maybe left school, entered the job market, not been happy where they were for whatever reason and then decided to come back and re-educate or re-skill themselves to move into other careers? Quite a, it, 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 is our, it is a large part of our population. In some instances, that's exactly what we cater to. And we've had examples in this model for, um, give you one quick one out of Waco, had an older student that said, I have to work. And I heard this was coming along. I wanted to come to TSTC in heating and air conditioning a year ago, but he said, I waited until this started. He said, I'm com he was able to come in in the mornings and work on his competencies, go to work, and then he was able to come back in the evenings and finish, because in the face-to-face -face labs, we're opening in the morning and closing late in the evening. So we're allowing you to be able to maybe work a part-time job. So we have a lot of individuals with children. They're trying to, trying to balance it all we feel like this is more accommodating than a strict schedule, a traditional schedule. So we've had examples where they've really, really touted some of this. If I can add to that, Kyle, one of the things with regards to the lab time, you know, Kyle referenced of how the students really take the initiative and responsibility for their learning. They actually are able to just sign up. They'll have, there'll be open slots on the calendar for them to come into the lab. And so it's really driven by their availability and accessibility into the lab. So they'll sign up. They can come in early in the morning, late in the evenings, during an extended lunch break. And so they're able to go into the calendar and, and reserve their slot in the lab to be able to come in and work on their competencies. Well, I'm taking up way too much time on that part. It, it's when you feel passionately about it, it's hard to get it all, hard to get it all squeezed in. Take a question and then I'll move on to the, the companion initiative to this. Um, is this program also available at the Marshall campus? Or yes. Is it, it is. It's okay. going, it's going by program. We, we moved, we took all 10 campuses and moved them under a single accreditation in 2015. And so it's going by program. So if we went with HVAC, HVAC, heating and air conditioning, that meant it went PBE at every campus it's offered at. So it's not, not going by campus, but it's transitioning by program. Now, if you're gonna spend 18 months deconstructing a curriculum, how do you know you have the right curriculum? Because you can deconstruct a bad curriculum and have a competency-based program. And so that's the companion process, which is career pathways and so this goes back to Clidia touched on it very nicely the reverse engineering working with business and industry uh, and you know again in a competency-based program 
you really had better uh, have that input from bus business and industry. Uh, we have always said, oh, we're industry driven, but have we always been truly? Um, I don't know. Probably not as, not as acutely as we are becoming now. These are speaking to the credentials. Hmm. Part of it didn't show up on that one. There it is, sorry. <laughs> Needed to hit the technical college here. <laughs> uh, associate, associate degrees, certificate degrees, in, industry credentialing, customized training, short-term training. You know, we, Clydia has a, a deep background in workforce development and the non-credit side of the fence. There's a point coming where we're gonna blur the lines between credit and non-credit. Instruction is instruction. Period. Competencies are competencies. And so as we hear more and more from potential employers, we don't care which it is, just get them trained. Then we're, there's going to be more of a blending between these areas. Gosh, speaking to programs, here's all sorts of programs that'll be, uh, that are undergoing all of this. Uh, you see electrical line worker over there to the next, in the middle, to the right hand side, uh, right past automotive. Those Two programs went PBE this, this fall. Automotive and linemen did. So we've started, we kind of front loaded with 100% online programs first. Now we're starting to get into the hybrid programs more and more. So just a lot, a lot to choose from. What, speaking back to uh, the information Clydia gave earlier, we're looking for high yield. We're looking for high, not just high demand, we're looking for the higher salaries. You're not going to see cosmetology on here. That may be a need. God bless anybody that wants to provide that and does. We're all for it. That is a need. But that's not going to probably be something we're interested in at the moment. You know? So you're not going to see that on here. 70% of the training is hands-on. That's, that's kind of the learning profile of many of our students. There's that population in every high school that doesn't want to go the four-year academic route doesn't want to spend that time, maybe have that student loan debt. They're more hands-on, visual, kinesthetic learners. That's the profile of the student we often get. My wife and I have seven children together in a blended family. Three went through TSTC, three went the academic route, one didn't do anything at all. The three that went to the, the uh, academic route don't like hearing what the three technical graduates are earning right now. <laughs> It does, it's kind of like you don't talk about religion, you know, you don't talk, and you don't talk about earnings at our table. Here's some industry partnerships. Clydia has been instrumental in many of these. Here's the pathway process. It's really a six-step process, and this is how we prepare a curriculum to go PBE, to make sure we are teaching the right competencies. There is a reference in here to a tool called Calibrate. That's exclusive to us. We have a vice chancellor by the name of Michael Bettersworth here in Austin. He and his group developed this, and it is absolutely wonderful for vetting competencies with business and industry. We may have a department choose five companies they're working with in business and industry, and we will send them three to 500 competencies they'll come back and then we're looking at where are the redundancies, where are the gaps, how can we make sure that we're putting the best product out there imaginable. So we'll vet it internally with our faculty and our department chairs and then ultimately we'll take it externally and by the time we get all of this done, there's just different ways of explaining the six-step process. This is what it would look like. I would love for our degree plans to start looking like this when we hand something out for a perspective to a prospective student and parents. This is so transparent. Not only does it break it up like we talk about with stackable c credentials and things like that, it can tell you if you do decide to exit at a certain point how much you can expect to make. And then if you decide to come back to us and step back in and finish the next highest level 
um, credential, here's what you can expect to make. So we spend a lot of time, now you've got everything you need here for badging, micro-credentialing, you could play the non-credit card, you could play the credit card with the regular courses, you have everything that you need right here. And we have seen as a result of this process, we've had faculty that haven't been in business and industry for 15 to 20 years, and this input has come back and they're like, wow, I didn't think this was so important or I wasn't considering this, but the industry has changed since I worked in it and we're making curricular adjustments based on that, on that feedback. Uh, we've had some very significant changes to curriculum as a result of this. Another way to look at it, that's process ops. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Clidia. She's gonna talk a little bit about some more data for us, placement of graduates. Um, I think for the sake of time, I can hang around with you and take questions, but um, there's just a lot, a lot to this. It is a work in progress, but we have press play. We have over 20 programs in the model, and that's about a third of our total inventory, and we're bringing on more the next fall. We still have the diesels and weldings and some of our really bread and butter programs to still transition, but anyhow. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. You know, one of the things that I would like to point out in, in one of these slides, part of that pathway process is really getting that d input from our employer partners with regards to the jobs. So I'm gonna attempt to see if this thing has a little pointer, there we go. So down here, you'll see how we've even broken it down to if they exit at this point, these are the jobs that they'd be able to get and these are the wages that they'd be leaning towards. If they exit at this point, this is what the positions and so on. I think the, the slide might cut it off a little bit at the bottom. But so we're, students are clearly able to see that progression of the career and if they continue. So if, they have, if life happens and they have to exit out, but then life happens again and they're able to come back in, the multiple entry, multiple exit lends itself for them to be able to have that career progression within uh, et their educational journey as well. I might interject on that when we, in some of our programs upon initial analysis, we found that we had certain ones that you didn't attain. They were, so, they were at such a high credit hour total. You didn't get to them until you'd been with us basically two semesters or more. And so we, we were like, no, there, there is a opportunity for one level one certificates that are just a semester or two. That's it. And we hear, hear that a lot from, and those that graduate from those programs often make just as much or more than the associate degree graduates. So we are really trying to do a stair-step process and not have these long lapses of, of time between a level one cert and the, and the other certs, or not having a level one cert at all. Every program should have a level one cert. You're never gonna convince me that a semester or two doesn't teach enough to a student to be marketable. I really, I really believe that. I think we do have a question. If you wanna wait for the microphone so we can make sure everybody hears you. Thank you. I was just going to ask that for your multiple entry version of it, do you have a time frame on which it's gonna to be too long before they can go back into it? And then also, um, because um, we know the technology changes for most of those in between depending on how long it is. That brings up two really good questions. So very quickly, on the time element of it, say you're in a, if you're in a 15 week semester, if you haven't finished your coursework that you originally signed up for by week 10 or 11, we're not gonna let you take that extra course because there's not a reasonable amount of time left to, to do, and actually it could be detrimental. So, and we have a lot of students because it's a flipped classroom, lectures are online, 24-7 20, access to those lectures, they can accelerate, be ready for those labs. Um, I forgot my other point, what you were bringing up. Say, ask your question again one more time. On the multiple entries on whether or not, um, like I guess for the, uh, the industry, like the different types of, uh, uh, oh my God, I just, <laughs> 
No, I forgot what it was. Um, it's it's, it's yeah. contagious. Yeah, the technology. Technology, technology. technology. yeah. Changes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, so thank you for that. One other thing I wanted to mention is if you drop out of a competency-based program and there's a year or two lapse, we'll let you up to a year, we'll let you come back in and pick up where you left off. After a year, that's exactly it. it the technology may have changed. The competencies may have changed. But from a retention standpoint, we'll let you pick up where you left off in the course. So if, you, if you're in a course and you make it through module eight and there's 10 modules and you drop out and you come back say a semester or two later, we'll let you pick up with module eight. We're not gonna make you start back completely over in the course. So, so then on that note, um, if something changes in the industry, fairly quickly after you graduate from that, will, there be able, will they be able to go back in and retake it without having to do, like pay too much more for the new training? Yeah, we'll make sure that they get it before they leave. We may have to add it in somewhere, but we'll tag it in and make sure they have it. And you know, we, we shared a little bit about the different uh, outcomes or degrees that some of the students can get. A lot of our training through our non-credit side of the house, our continuing ed, focuses on those uh, operational changes within industry. And so TSTC really works to make sure that we are maintaining the relevance with whatever new developments or new, uh, new processes within the, uh, the employer partners that we're working with. And so we'll provide customized training if it's specifically for one agency or one company, or if it's an industry shift, then we'll work to be able to either embed it into our current and or provide opportunities. And we work very closely. I see one of our partners, Sally Pettis here, we'll work very closely in its constant dialogue because they're meeting with employers as well and saying, you know what, there's this major operational change coming and there is funding for us to be, and that's where the skills grants come in and so on and so forth. So we really learn to blend and be able to provide that braided opportunity and it's a collaboration with all the partners to make sure that we're able to provide that reskilling as those sh- processes shift because it's not only going to be that one individual that exited out that needs the training it'll be the entire training uh, all the incumbents for that employer and so we'll, we have strategies and, and uh, processes for us to be able to help them with that as well thank you for your questions on that any questions? If not, I'm just going to do some last final touches. Uh, we're at the end stretch here. You guys can stretch a little. Just prop yourselves up. A couple more slides, and we'll do- we'll be done. You know. I talked about the collaboration that, and the partnership that we have with the Workforce Commission for Data, and a lot of that is we're able to track our students that went through our programs. Some of the data that is not captured are individuals that are self-employed companies that have their HR payroll paid out of another, or housed out in another state and not in the state of Texas. And so we want to, that we try to identify that and do our own uh, outreach to the students and our graduates. And so based on certified data through the Workforce Commission, our placement across the state is at about an 83%. So when we go back and validate that where we are reaching out to the employers directly and or getting the information directly from the, from the clients themselves, we're actually at an, about a 94% placement rate. But captured with TWC data, we're at an 83% placement rate, which I think is pretty good statewide. Thank you. When we drill down into some of this data by region, our UCHEC campus, our Hutto campus, actually has 100% placement. So we have pockets of you know, locations where our placement rate is higher than our average statewide rate. As I mentioned, our close collaboration is with business and industry, and our state stats speak to that. We're actually here, I'm not gonna read them all, uh, but we are the number one aviation maintenance program in Texas in 2020. We were not named number one diesel equipment technology program in 2020. Our plumbing and pipe fitting, that is a unique collaboration that we also have with a plumbing board. Before anybody that wanted to get their license had to come and test here in Austin and had to you know, meet their 8,000 plus hours and so on and so forth, we've been able to provide an accelerated model for individuals wanting to get their licensure through TSTC and the plumbing board uh, endorses that and they're actually able to test at our Waco campus. And we're having conversations to see how can we expand that and make that accessible across the state. 
Welding is one of our larger programs. You know, I, off, I love bragging on, you know, how Texas is big. Well, tex TSTC is Texas Technical Training, Training Arm, so what we do is also very big. Our welding lab in Waco alone has how many welding stations? About 400 or so? Uh, I mean, about 200, 200 and some, I'm sorry, and, we have over 400 students, thank you, rolling. fact check me on that. So we have over 200 uh, welding stations. So usually when we have employers or site selectors coming to look at what we can provide when it comes to workforce development, they're expecting to walk into a little welding lab with like 10 boots, you know, and then we're like, okay, now walk into our, <laughs> you know, welding lab. And so um, everything is bigger in Texas, especially at TSTC. But our reach, while we focus on Texas and our, our primary focus is Texas employers and our students uh, working in the state of Texas, we also see an increase and an impact that, that spills over nationwide. We're the number one in the US for conferring the most associate degrees in engineering, our number one electrical line worker technology program in the US, number seven welding program in the US, as well as our cybersecurity is actually a center of excellence that is endorsed by the NSA and Homeland Security. All of our curriculum is, uh, is vetted by them and has a seal of approval from their agencies. Some of, of the great accomplishments at TSTC. We are also considered a military-friendly school. Kyle mentioned some of the work we're trying to do to make sure that we're providing our uh, men and women that were in the service to be able to accelerate and give them more accessibility into some of our programs. In 2022, we were named the best com community college in America, number three in, in, in the nation, and number one in the state of Texas. And I'll leave that slide there for a little bit. No, I'm just joking. Any questions? I really appreciate you guys uh, making the time to be here this afternoon. I know how difficult it can be, especially when you're needing that afternoon coffee. So thank you so much for, for your attendance. We'll go ahead and take some questions. So do, uh, I, I have a question about the welding program because I do have a student that's graduating in May. Um, what was the deadline to apply for that uh, welding program, and do they have uh, housing? So you're asking if what is the deadline to apply for the program? For the program, because he graduates in May. Okay, I don't have that date with me, okay. but we will get that information over to you. Uh, what location are we looking at? Well, I'm in Houston. You're so in Houston, so we have our Fort Bend campus there. Oh. Yes, so we have a campus That's near amazing. you. That's our new slogan, a campus near you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. And so we do have our Fort Bend campus that's right in the outskirts of Houston. So I will, if I can... Jump to, I'm gonna jump back all the way to the front so we can get you that first map so you guys can see all the different locations that we have. I will say this while she's moving back, it hasn't been without challenges. So if there was a college that wanted to start something similar, I'd be the perfect person to tell them what to avoid and, and where some of the challenges lie. So, you know, we're not gonna be shy about that. Um, but there's enough <coughs> positive information coming in that it reaffirms that this is our future. This is the direction that we want to go. So the blue flyer is the one that's considered the Houston? No, Fort Bend County. Oh, no. We're down here. Yeah. So we have, so I'll go through them real <laughs> briefly. So we have our South Texas campus in Harlingen our Fort Bend campus that's in uh, right outside of Houston. In, uh, it's right after, it's in Rosenberg. But, yeah, but, but East, they're, they're it's right on 59. You'll see it as, as you're going north I, or south. I can attest there is a Sweetwater down there. That's, that's what I knew okay. you were alluding to. There's a Sweetwater down there. Our East Williamson County is in Hutto. Waco, which is our headquarters, is in Central Texas. North Texas is our Red Oak campus. Marshall, and then our four West Texas campuses are Breckenridge, Abilene, Brownwood, and Sweetwater. And I'm not gonna try to point to where New Braunfels is on the map, because they'll get mad at me because I'm very geographically challenged. But North New Braunfels is coming in somewhere around here. <laughs> it's close, right? It's in Texas. <laughs> Yes. Yes, so there is financial aid. Uh, the question was, can they apply for financial aid? 
Yes, yeah, so financial assistance is available. Uh, again, we work very, we are on the ETPS uh, provider list, and so a lot of our programs, I'm not saying it depends on the region, most of our programs are listed on the ETPS, so they are eligible to access uh, workforce funds. We, they're able to submit for Pell Grant. Uh, there, we have a foundation that raises funds for scholarships, so we do have scholarships available as well. Um, and so we are, a, we are an accredited institution, and so we are accredited by SAC COC. Therefore, we're able to, and eligible for, for financial aid. Thank you for those questions. And I'll get you that information with regards to the deadlines. Any other questions? I mean, I promise to make it quick. Um, a lot of those jobs that you posted, um, you require a state certification, a state license for that. Like your pipe fitting, your nursing, um, electricians, a lot of those. Do y'all require that? Or do you just push them to that? Like, like how does that work? So it varies. It depends on what the employer is seeking. For our allied health programs, they do go through the, let it be the state or the national credentialing, and they'll get either that licensure or their certi that certificate that is required. Okay. There's a lot of disciplines, like for example, linemen, welding, that there are several um, certification agencies like AWS, NCCER, so on and so forth. So we try, if, if it is required by the employer, we will go ahead and provide them that credentialing. If it is not required, we again, our main intent is to make sure we get them hireable. We're not gonna put them through extra work or extra expenses that the employer is not requiring. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you know, there's a lot of programs like nursing, emergency medical, even aviation <coughs> out in West Texas where it's power plant or airframe where they ultimately need to pass the FAA exams, we're preparing them to pass those exams. You know, they really can't work in that field without that certification or set of certifications. So sometimes we're preparing them to take those exams, to take those certifications. I will put our contact information up if, and we do have some business cards if you wanna uh, take one of those. Uh, we welcome any kind of input. We, you know, again, we generally believe that it is a collaboration and it takes all of us to be able to make an impact. And so we welcome the interaction. Like I mentioned, Sally and, and our, at least in South Texas, uh, Sally is our partner in South Texas and we're constantly uh, bugging her. <laughs> and so working alongside with her because their success is our success, our success is theirs, and so we wanna make sure that we are able to build that across the state. Thank you once again, and I'll turn it over to our facilitator, our moderator. I don't have anything else, unless anyone has questions. Other than that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for attending the forum.